Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about the most populous stars in our galaxy, known as red dwarfs. And more specifically, we're going to try to answer the question, can anything actually survive in these star systems? Can any life prosper here? And hypothetically, can life actually produce oxygen? So the question we're going to try to answer is, can photosynthesis occur around red dwarfs? And all of this is based on a relatively recent study that you can, as always, find in the description below that performed a really interesting analysis of whether certain bacteria can survive in simulated conditions similar to the conditions we would find around a typical red dwarf star. And so in this case, the only purpose of the study was to see if photosynthesis, one of the most important chemical reactions on the planet, can hypothetically occur around a typical red dwarf, or if it's something that we shouldn't even try to look for because it's impossible both chemically and of course physically. And this question is of course really important because most of our knowledge of life is from our own star system, from the star system known as, well, the solar system of course, and the star here is what's known as G-type star, but they're not actually that common. The most common type of a star is this one right here, a typical red dwarf. And moreover, all of the most exciting discoveries of different exoplanets so far, including all of the exoplanets we're discovering right now, the vast majority of them are actually around red dwarfs. Including the most exciting discovery of the nearest star system in Proxima Centauri, and the two planets with one Proxima B being located in the region where we kind of expect liquid water to exist, in the so-called habitable zone. And with all of these other red dwarf systems out there, including the famous TRAPPIST-1 system, it's kind of important for us to understand if life can hypothetically exist here. Obviously, we want to know if life could have developed here naturally, but also if one day we become some sort of a species that learns how to travel across stars and learns how to colonize other star systems, we would want to find out if being able to establish a functioning colony here is a possibility. Can plants grow here? Can we, for example, establish a farm on the brighter side of this planet and use this stellar light for photosynthesis? Because we know, for example, that red dwarfs actually produce a lot less optical light, and as you can see also a lot of flares, and they also don't produce as much light that's usually uh, required by plants. And so even though these stars are really bright in the infrared, they are very dim in the optical frequency of light, and of all of the frequencies, they seem to mostly produce red light. And to try to explain to you why this is a very intriguing question, let's take a look at the difference between a typical red dwarf and our own sun. In this simulation, you can kind of see the size differences, but what's not apparent here is the difference in luminosity or the amount and types of light produced. Here, unfortunately, the red dwarf does seem like a pretty bright star as well. But you can see the more realistic radiance or spectral radiance in this case in this graph. Notice how a star like our sun mostly produces visible light and also has a relatively high spectral radiance for this light. And these are the frequencies that are normally used by various plants and also various algae during chemical reactions like photosynthesis. But a much cooler star, such as a typical red dwarf, will only have a very tiny amount of light as red light, with only some light being yellow, and the vast majority of it is going to be in infrared or even longer wavelengths, with the total radiance being much lower as well. So not only do red dwarfs have mostly red light, they also seem to have very low amounts of light to begin with, meaning that all of the planets here will be extremely dim, and any potential life on the surface will mostly be receiving a lot of red light. Well, actually, no, some red light, not a lot of it at all. But these amounts are so minuscule that it's important to know if anything can possibly survive here. And this is why this experiment and this particular study are so interesting, because they were able to create these artificial conditions that we would expect around a typical red dwarf, and they were then able to test these conditions scientifically by varying certain parameters and also by using certain organisms that we know can exist in these extreme conditions. Which also, by the way, includes extreme radiation and potential flare conditions that we can usually find around a typical red dwarf. And by the way, completely unrelated to all of this, and this is more of a sci-fi slash geeky fact, but you know how eyes on Earth evolved to see things in the optical light? And we know that... In the Predator series, Predator for the most part sees the infrared light as their main source. So it's totally natural to assume here that Predator as a species came from some sort of a red dwarf star somewhere nearby. 
Which also scientifically makes sense, because any life evolving around red dwarfs would most likely develop an ability to see in the infrared, not so much optical light. Anyway, getting off track, back to reality, photosynthesis, and possible life on other planets. Let's start with this map right here. This is actually a map of photosynthesis on planet Earth. Here on land you can see that the dark green, that's essentially the various amounts of chlorophyll on the surface of the planet, with very little here in the Sahara Desert, a lot here in the Sub-Saharan regions. But notice how in the waters we also have quite a lot of various hotspots, especially one right here, and also a few right here in the Arctic, some right here, and of course one in the Black Sea and one in the Caspian Sea that also have very high concentrations of chlorophyll and thus the ability to produce oxygen on the planet. With really large amounts of oxygen coming from these regions in the oceans and specifically oceanic phytoplankton which usually resides in certain regions around the planet. But all of the life on planet Earth requires light to be of certain frequency, specifically between 400 nanometers and 700 nanometers or in other words, between violet light and red light. Anything lower than that in wavelength becomes ultraviolet and that's actually slightly more dangerous to life because it starts breaking up the cells themselves. But anything longer than that becomes infrared and infrared just doesn't have enough energy for most of the life on the planet. But in the last few years, scientists have discovered a lot of different specific extremophiles and here we're talking about cyanobacteria extremophiles that do actually survive on the light that is in infrared. And here we're talking about light that's about 750 nanometers in wavelength. These strange bacteria found a way to survive and to thrive in conditions where no other bacteria can survive because, well, it's not enough energy for them to create necessary chemicals and to initiate photosynthesis. And naturally the next step was to put these bacteria into these experimental conditions and then see if the bacteria could reproduce, survive, and photosynthesize for up to 240 hours. To make this a little bit more scientific, they actually chose three conditions. One was very similar to the starlight that our sun produces, one was similar to a typical red dwarf, and the last one was just that infrared light, a light that's about 750 nanometers in wavelength. And I guess not surprisingly, all of the bacteria used in this study were able to survive and thrive in the conditions similar to a typical red dwarf. But a lot of these bacteria were not actually able to grow with just that far red light, mostly because they're not able to photosynthesize and to produce other types of chlorophyll in certain conditions. In other words, these bacteria were actually using some of the available light, such as orange and yellow light, that is also available around red dwarfs. But at least two bacteria were to some extent successful even with that little amount of red light, meaning that even in the extreme conditions where mostly the red light is produced by a red dwarf, we should still expect at least some types of photosynthesis to be possible. And so what does all of this mean? Let's jump onto the hypothetical surface of a TRAPPIST-1 planet and briefly talk about the implications. So this is what it might actually look like on the surface here. Now, if we have water, or hypothetical water, and if we have a star that produces predominantly red, infrared, and some yellow light, we might be able to discover certain bacteria and certain algae here that has adopted to basically use these conditions to produce oxygen and to produce other atmospheric conditions that could be necessary for other types of life to develop. And because we're talking about extremophiles here that are able to survive very hot conditions and even high radiation, they could also hypothetically survive very powerful flares coming from these red dwarfs as well. And because photosynthesis is now theoretically possible and because life can hypothetically survive here, the next step would be to start looking for the signs of oxygen coming from the surfaces from the atmospheres of these distant planets, such as the planets in the TRAPPIST-1 system. But obviously just seeing signs of oxygen might not really be a good proof that some kind of a vegetation or some kind of a bacteria live on the surface of this particular planet. We know that oxygen can be produced through other chemical means. There is, however, a very interesting technique that could be used by the upcoming missions, such as the James Webb Telescope, that is already used here on Earth to determine, for example, the health conditions of various forests on planet Earth. So the way we study this today is using the phenomenon known as the red edge. Red edge in this case being this edge right here at the end of the red light. And this interesting phenomenon applies to all of the vegetation on the planet, 
When a typical leaf starts absorbing the light from the sun, it actually ends up absorbing most of the optical light, including all of the colors of the rainbow, and some of the higher frequencies, such as ultraviolet light, either goes through the leaf or gets to interact with some of the structures potentially damaging them. But the infrared light surprisingly gets reflected by the structures inside the leaf. And because of this, if you were to look at a typical tree or really any vegetation in the infrared light, you would see this extremely bright, extremely oversaturated object, which is exceptionally easy to see from outer space as well. All of the trees and all of the vegetation basically create this very interesting reflective infrared and also very saturated picture that is visible from a very far away distance. And so naturally, if we were to see something similar coming from another planet, this unusual reflectivity and unusual appearance of a red edge on another planet, the only natural explanation here is that something is creating similar structures to a typical leaf or a typical tree on another planet. But in case of red dwarf planets, we would expect this red edge to be maybe slightly farther toward the infrared, maybe around 750, maybe even 800 nanometers. So basically slightly shifted to the right on this picture right here. And detecting something like this from, for example, Proxima Centauri, which can totally be done by James Webb Telescope in the next few years, would only mean that we've just found the possible signs of vast amounts of algae, trees, or some other strange life that's producing these effects and is also producing a lot of oxygen on these distant planets. And if by some luck we actually do find this on Proxima b, which is of course the nearest uh, red dwarf planet to us, this means that this probably exists around the majority of planets out there, simply statistically speaking. If however we don't find anything, well that's kind of expected right now. Statistically we don't think we'll find anything here. But once again, this is only something we're going to know in the future once better telescopes are available to us and once we're able to observe these things in the infrared with much higher resolution and, of course, much better visibility. For now, we can only speculate and can possibly do experiments, such as, of course, the brilliant experiment I mentioned in this video, that you can read more about in the paper in the description below. Until we discover something else or until another really cool experiment, that's pretty much all I wanted to mention in this video. And because of this, I'm always fascinated to talk about this idea of astrobiology or life outside of planet Earth. But for now, that's all I wanted to mention. Thank you for watching. Subscribe if you still haven't. Share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences. And maybe come back tomorrow to learn something you might have not known. Also, maybe support this channel on Patreon or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description below. Thank you so much for all of your support over the years. And I'll see you tomorrow. Space out. And as always, bye-bye.